You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. Welcome back to The Buzz, brought to you by the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. I am Fran Chismar. And I'm Tom Knezic, and today we have episode 43 of what may be the only podcast raving about the type of grass you don't want to smell. (laughs) So if you've been paying attention to the news, that's a little New Jersey-centric joke. Uh, New New Jersey, it's official. Even though it was voted on uh, in November, it's official that marijuana is now legal. But marijuana isn't a native plant. No, so we're not um, we're not so gonna we're talk not about talking about that one. We are talking about our native graminoids today. Yes. Um, but first, I want to say, did everyone miss me from from last episode? Yeah, I, yeah. You know what, man? I I missed you. It it wasn't the same. I was really uh, a little flustered, but it just you know, and it helped that there were four other people with big personalities, mm-hmm. even though they behaved themselves <laughs> on on that Zoom chat. Like they kind of toned it down, but it just it's not the same rapport. Like yeah, totally, I yeah. felt like it went it went from three dimensional to kind of one dimensional. But yeah, it was just a last minute emergency, and I I texted Fran and said, "Hey, if you're okay doing it on your own, mm-hmm. uh, go ahead and do it. If not, we'll postpone it and find another time." But Fran made the decision to do it, and he really did great. Thank I thought you. you did a really good Thank job. You. Thank you. But I was glad he didn't do so great <laughs> that you could kind of leave me in the dust <laughs> and forget about me. It's still got to be a two man booth. <laughs> you know, it's we <laughs> they uh. If, if you listen to the beginning of it, you can see how flustered I am. I'm like, hey, it's uh, uh, Fran, um, <laughs> and we're going to go right to the guests. Like, I was just totally <laughs> flustered. It took me a little bit. Fortunately, everyone had a lot to say, mm-hmm. and it took a lot of the pressure off me. Yeah. I just kind of had to point them in the right direction yeah. and let them talk. And so. that was – I got to listen uh, over the weekend right after it released, and, man, that was a great episode. I was a little worried that people would be um, – a little lost because you have realistically four of the brightest people in the, in probably in the world when it comes yeah. to restorations. And then you had you too, friend. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. But you had, <laughs> realistically you had some people and when you get those type of minds in the same room, sometimes they can assume that um, everyone knows what they're talking about, but. I mean, you had a lawyer, a former oh, lawyer, was, you had a, yeah. you know, Emil who has his doctorate. It was just, you know, Bill teaches at University of Penn, Carl, and all of his accomplishments. It was, you know, and they've all worked together and they've all done such great work. But when they're getting into the the nuts and bolts of it, it was mm-hmm. heady for me. Like, oh, yeah. it, it was yeah. like at a couple points, I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was trying to just comprehend it all. It's, so, But I think it really illustrated the point of how involved these restoration projects are and how if they're successful, you don't even know that they happened. You just think it became a park with a lot of, uh, of places you can kayak or hike or, exactly. or trails like that. Or in my mind, it's, it's things that are going on and you're driving along the highway and you're looking out the window and you didn't even realize that that used to be a super fun site or a brownfield. There's just something that was degraded. Um, and now it's unrecognizable in a good way. You know, we have so few open natural sites and it's it's funny that when you look at that site, it took a lot of work to make that yeah, <laughs> naturalized. Yeah. You know, it, it didn't just happen. It wasn't just there. We we had to put a lot of work into it. Mm-hmm. And and there's a lot of red tape involved in that. And there's a lot of moving parts. And it's mm-hmm. it's always wonderful when you see all these organizations working together and that's the end result. Yeah, and, and and I'm blanking on the phrase right now, but even I've almost chose it for my article that I, but mm-hmm. it was a little bit too short. But the Fish and Wildlife Services, we talked about um, or you guys talked about the types of government that were involved in this. Well, Fish and Wildlife Service just came out with something uh, in the last couple of days where they're going to, it was either, this is a big difference. It was either 27 million or 27 billion. I don't really <laughs> yeah, that remember. Big, that's a well, big difference a, in funding. Yeah. But there was still, that's <laughs> more money than I think you or I are ever going to see in our lives. Exactly. Um, and it's all going towards uh, coastal resiliency and restoration projects, I think it was in like 14 different states to help fund them and get them off the ground because we need our coast to be resilient, not just for us, but for, for our wildlife as well. There's, there's really a lot. We've, we've really done a lot to abuse coastlines over the last few decades. Mm -hmm. And it's right now, especially with climate, climate change, this is the do or die area. Like we need to 
be safe. Now we've seen it whenever, you know, Hurricane Sandy. Yeah, that was a bad hurricane, but it rocked us harder than previous hurricanes yeah. for for multiple different reasons. We we weren't prepared, and so much of our natural dunes and everything are depleted. So it's 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 nice that. <laughs> it's it's nice that our shorelines are getting protected yes yeah it definitely is and uh so if you haven't listened to that episode if you're new to us or or you decided hey i'm not interested skip it uh i don't I, that it was a lot to take in so if you if you don't want to jump into that go ahead and, and wait and do it later but if you are new to us and you want to go back and listen we're gonna give you a second we're gonna take a pause Yes. You're going to go back and listen. There's a lot to take in, but a lot of great information that you're going to come away with. Exactly. So ready? One, two, three. We're paused. Okay. We're back. All right. Thank you for listening that. I hope you're excited as I was when we, when we introduced this episode. Yeah. um, About that last episode, but uh, we got a lot to unpack again today, friend, continuing our, our plant. We never really still came up with a title, but our plant, uh uh spotlights uh, i guess yeah um this time talking about graminoids but we have our segments to get out of the way first yeah. so why don't we uh we start with the plants that we're vibing with this week in that's hot it's hot so we really need to kind of discuss the winner before we proceed with the new ones i would imagine right well, oh, that's that, not how I'm. That wow, would be, that, that would be, be a whole different segment. segment. <laughs> this that, that would be a whole different segment, wouldn't it? Wow. <laughs> we, can, we can talk about my See, win now if you prefer to get it out of the no, way. No, I'm just. I just wanted to get it out of the way that I lost, but <laughs> but we'll go back to my. That's hot, actually. <laughs> wow, that was. I'm having a Fran day. All right. So, do you want to go first, or would you? I'm gonna let you go first. All right. So, I'm gonna just quickly change my background so that I'm vibing with uh my that's hot. So, let me see here. You might have to duck so everyone on the video can see. Oh, you it. can kind of see it's this another, all around me. Another episode in bad podcasting. <laughs> that, <laughs> it's it's kind of effect. it's kind of all around me. So, um, you know, we were saying this time of the year it it becomes harder and harder to come up with things that are hot because a lot of things are dormant. You know, obviously a lot of the, the graminoids uh, or the um, Forbes aren't, you know, there's, there's things that show interest, but it's not the same as Mm -hmm. summer. And we've gone through a lot of the obvious ones, but um, you know, again, just sometimes I just happen to peer out the window and I was like, wow, the the birch look great. So Mm -hmm. uh, my, that's hot for, for this episode of the buzz is uh, river birch, Betula nigra. It's facultative wet. Um, you know, it's not that that you know white European birch look, mm-hmm. but you get that. It's like a cinnamon brown exfoliating bark. It, it's great in floodplains. It, it's a floodplain plant, uh, given that it's facultative wet. Uh, you know, it has smaller leaves. So you know, rain gardens. A lot of the time, people want to put trees in rain gardens, and we kind of try to. I'm I'm not a fan of that mm-hmm. because of the leaf litter because you want that that rain garden to really percolate. You want that yeah. water to go yeah, through. Yeah, it's it. supposed to drain. Yeah, and the leaf litter can cl- basically yeah. effectively clog it. Like yeah, and wood you do- pipes or and, other drains. So. And, and you don't want to be walking through it, but it's got smaller leaves, so if you have it on the outskirts of a rain garden, mm-hmm. it doesn't doesn't uh, litter it as much. But you do still get beneficial leaf litter for for the garden. Um, it can handle dry, even though it's a facultative wet. It it it, it can handle dry. It hosts several uh, Lepidoptera, uh, and it's a good food source for birds like uh, turkey and grouse eat the seed, which I didn't know. Yeah, so um, that's, very cool. that's great. Deer will deer will browse the leaves, but deer browse just about everything. We're yeah, and talk I f- about. figure in that case, it well, the one in my yard, I don't think the deer could even reach the, the <laughs> lowest no, branches. So. Yeah, and and the the fact that I I was able to come with that was the most interesting fact that if you chew the leaves, it can help treat dysentery. So that's good to know (laughs) just in case you know (laughs) you ever run into that problem and 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 you're void of of medicine there's a a natural a natural leaf for dysentery Mm -hmm. hopefully that i i never have that yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) so my choice this week is uh again we're it's just barely we're almost to spring and i'm getting very hopeful um one because then we'll have a plethora of plants to choose from but two it's also things are starting to green up and uh, just looking at our little front garden in front of our office, which is all native plants. Yeah. Um, and I doubt this would be the case in other uh, in-ground gardens in New Jersey. This is a raised bed. But our uh, purple lovegrass or Aragrasta spectabilis 
was just the leaves were just starting to emerge from their their uh the the bunch Third, at the bottom yeah. it's just starting to get show a little bit of green just little tiny um specks that are coming out of that plant and uh it to me it just gives me a little bit more energy springs around the corner we're hopefully not going to have that many more cold days in front of us it's you know it's, it's it's we went from snow just about once or twice a week now all of a sudden it's we're hitting mid mid 50s yeah, and at i the think i saw 60 next week so yeah so it's starting to get a little bit of you know it's funny my my property is my property should be wetlands mm -hmm. and it was almost <laughs> all underwater and just the weather last couple of days really yeah. Like I have no standing water left on my property. Yeah. I was wow. kind of shocked. So, but, uh, but that plant is, um, is fairly short. You know, it stays below like 18 inches. And even that it's kind of like not fuzzy. What's the right word? Um, pubescent cloud. Like <laughs> is, is the, if you look at it, the, it sends up these little tiny shoots off of the leaves that have little yeah. like purplish seed heads and it gets like a purple cloudish, uh, appearance. Um, yeah, it's, it's nice. And then, uh, it's an upland plant in most places here in our area. It's actually a facultative upland plant, but it likes it fairly dry. We see it oftentimes in the pine barrens where it's really sandy. Uh, and then it provides really good nesting habitat for a lot of ground nesting birds awesome. just because it, it stays low to the ground. It kind of forms that little cloudy canopy and the smaller birds can really sit underneath it and make a nest. Um, awesome. And it also i found out it has really high nutrition seeds for not for us, but for, uh, for birds as well. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Great but yeah, choice. That's, I'm very hopeful. And like, really, we're, we're probably an episode or two away from having whatever we want to choose from. We can, yeah, <laughs> you know, and it's, things to choose from. We, we had the fever for us in, in the wholesale nursery industry. This is where we start kicking in a lot of restoration projects are going to start going within the next week or two. We've been in full swing of production for, for a good week or two. So it's, we're really getting close to, you know, you feel it here like yeah the, that oh, yeah. energy is building up like we're we're all feeling pressed so yeah, that's a good feeling you know you it's pay right attention to our our pilots nursery instagram page i've been going out and my brother's been going out and we're taking pictures of stuff that's happening in the greenhouse and it's really cool i you look at the the juncus fuchsius um yeah. seeded trays and it's just like a little carpet of green like yeah. little stalks that are coming up and the iris is looking cool and stuff's getting big enough that we're actually going to start transplanting it it's a really fun time of year at the nursery because the fall wrapped up you're in this lull of winter where you're still busy but it's how would you describe it, Fran? it's more like preparation it, stuff it, it's not it's preparation you know there's a time in the winter on. where you know a lot of businesses do kind of go to sleep a little mm -hmm. bit you know you work so hard fall's a busy season for us so you, you kind of you, you hit the holidays and you want to take a break so you can re recover and they're doing prep on their end well that prep is starting to hit us so we're we're you know knowing it's like hey we're right around the corner we're we're some good weather away from really getting started yeah. so it's yeah. and, and we need that good weather to get production rolling so we're it's it's you <laughs> the amount of time we had to even talk to each other in the office is really it's getting more and more limited by the day yeah, so. yeah. but it's pretty cool but now we get to move on to your your favorite segment uh... friend uh this week's botany based current events this or that all right so i guess we do have to announce who the winner is uh, we've kind of said it but the winner is me i won yeah. again yeah so yeah. i think we're tied in the in the like the series yeah i i'm a little disappointed yeah. just we didn't get a lot of votes this week in in general but that's like okay i, I think we I, I, I don't remember if i think we posted think the episode was, a day or late or something we did but there's like i said we had some things going on so i typically it wasn't at the front it. of mind. i typically reshare it i didn't reshare i meant to reshare it on monday to to get some more votes but i think you won five to three so it wasn't a blow actually i think at one point you were winning i was like winning five to five zero. zero until yeah. i started to talk some smack in the in the facebook group <laughs> and then all of a sudden i, I got some seeing some, votes. some votes coming through <laughs> for you and uh so yeah but again that's a place go in and well for this our next round which we're about to present go into the facebook group join the facebook group first look for that post and then vote for which article you like best and give your feedback if you yeah. agree with an article if you disagree we're kind of presenting the articles and then uh, giving a little bit of our feedback 
and maybe you think we're dead wrong. So let yeah, us that's, know. that's true. But you know, and and in the Facebook group too, and on social media, there's been a lot of great infographics oh, yeah. that that really, you know, if 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 you didn't get the gist of the articles or if you didn't have a chance to listen, it gives you a really good breakdown mm -hmm. of of what we each presented and what the highlights were. So yep. what our mm -hmm. takeaway was. So well, you get to choose. Do you would you like to go first or I'm, would you like me to go first? I'm gonna let you go first again. I like it when you go first. It lets I, me know what I'm up against. I actually like going first. Did <laughs> did you see, I know I kind of told you about my article. Did you read my article? No. No, I didn't read so it. So I you know, it's because it's more of a scientific article, I, I really copied and pasted some highlights to mm -hmm. go over because it's instead of going through, you know, so much <laughs> scientific yeah. stuff, yeah. trying to just make it a little bit easier. So uh, the name of the article is Perceiving Predators, Understanding How Plants Sense Herbivore Attacks. And this was actually a study done out of the Tokyo University of Science, and it was published in Science Daily. And the gist of it is what signaling mechanisms do plants use to communicate an SOS signal? Uh, so far, it's been hypothesized that the signaling, signaling is made possible by proteins transported through the vascular tissue of plants. Interestingly, there is evidence of airborne signaling across plants, and we've talked about that. Uh, it's a phenomenon called talking plants. Upon damage, plants release a volatile chemical into the air, which can be uh, – perceived by neighboring plants. There's also yeah. evidence of uh, epigenetic uh, regulation of defense system wherein plants maintain a sort of genetic memory of the insects that have attacked them, and they can kind of fine tune their defense response accordingly for future attacks. So we talk about evolution. Yeah. This is part of that evolution process. They're learning about what's being done, and they can slowly work to get it. And science is just kind of understanding that and what they're doing. So uh, given the improvement in knowledge of the mechanisms of plant defense systems, um, scientists are kind of looking to embrace the possi possibility of a genetic form of pest control that can help circumvent the use of chemicals. So, uh, which with all the risks, you know, obviously we know chemicals are horrible, but farmer, farming and a lot of things, they kind of figure it a necessary evil. But this could be a modern scientifically sound way of organic farming that would free agricultural practices from harmful chemicals. So if they can learn like how plants do it genetically, they can help help that evolution process along without using chemicals. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, I, I thought it was a neat study and it's a study that kind of needs to happen. And they, they go into it within detail in the article, just when plants, you know, when an insect bites into it, it might secrete something and the plant remembers that secretion and may be able to actually recreate it. To yeah, that's, and that's, man, we're talking about like in, in with us, like the whole COVID vaccine, you know, that's yeah. what is happening. I guess you get infected and, and in most people, they're building up some form of immunity. Yeah. And then with the vaccinations, they're mimicking that. And so, but you wouldn't think about that. And the plants can do that. That's pretty amazing. You know, it's, and, and plants talk like it, there's no doubt in my mind, especially now that I'm reading braiding sweetgrass. Mm -hmm. That's one of the, uh, the, the chapters are talking about um, pecans mm -hmm. and that when they produce mass, they, they realize scientifically, probably if they were to produce a little bit of mast every year, they would never be able to reproduce because animals and humans use it, but they save it all up. They do it all at once. But when one, produces mass they all produce mass all across mm -hmm. the country and they're like how did they know like and yeah. it's regardless of the conditions that make them produce mass and they don't know if it's a year two years three years they all produce mass at one time so obviously they're communicating whether yeah. it be pheromones or mycorrhizae or or whatever but there's i'm convinced there's some kind of communication yeah i i think it's uh, more probable than not that yeah. that's happening it's yeah. just there's too many um was i'm trying i always blank on the words i'm trying to look for but uh there's too many things that are happening at the same time that it, it wouldn't it makes more sense that it would be they would be communicating them it would not yeah totally there's so a whole uh a presentation they did at the new jersey native plant society meeting a couple of years ago where it was talking about it was actually talking about that and i wish i remembered now that we're bringing it up yeah. <laughs> but uh but he was kind of he went into all the whole game theory stuff and like um and how basically all in a lot of cases plants aren't necessarily working together they're all looking out for their own best interests but yeah. sometimes their best interest is working together and yeah. 
it happens in that way. Yeah. But I'll have to find out what that was and who it was and and yeah, I would, then I can give him justice or give give him his due credit on yeah. his podcast instead I, of just barely tweet like <laughs> tapping into what he talked about. But I would love to know more about that too. If you yeah. come up with that, that's something I'd like to say. Yeah, but that's that's really fascinating. It's just that and I thought it was fascinating it's... that it came out of the University of Tokyo too. Yeah. Like I would assume it'd be somewhere stateside, but uh, you know, that that's a really progressive study and I'd like to see where that goes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my article this week was uh, out of the New York times again, which I apologize for everyone who is going to log in and try and read this article, because if you're doing it from a desktop or a laptop, it might not let you in. I found the workaround is if you log in from a phone, sometimes you can get behind the paywall. Gotcha. The New York Times, they're just trying to get your money. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, yeah, I'm not getting a kickback from the New York Times for yeah. keep sending people there. But they had an article that actually I saw on, on through LinkedIn is where I saw it shared by, um, by one of our listeners and one of our customers and one of our friends, Amy Green. And she shared an article uh, called A Different Kind of Land Management, Let the Cows Stomp. And uh, basically, it went really into um, regenerative ranching, I guess, not full regenerative agriculture, but regenerative ranching. And there's a, a bunch of farms, especially in Texas, where they're looking uh, into rebuilding soil through ranching. And basically, they, they pasture off their cows with electric fence, and they change the electric fence every day, and only let them forage on small areas of that pasture. Okay. While they're doing that, they're not only are they they pooping and putting back nutrients in the soil that way but one of the things they're doing is they're as they walk as they're grazing they're stepping on a lot of the plants so you think about uh something like well milkweed for instance yeah and now milkweed is a beneficial plant so it's probably not the best example but if you stepped on a milkweed stem and you had a big hoof it would probably snap the stem and yeah maybe it would regenerate some but there's a good chance if it got stepped on enough it's not going to come back yeah so milkweed, we want to come back, but there's a lot of weeds that we don't want to come back. And this is what's happening is as these, uh, a lot of annual weeds get stepped on, they get broken. They might be able to regenerate once or twice, but as they get continued to get stepped on, they don't come back. They're, they're removed from the landscape effectively because they aren't going out to seed and the roots die. Um, and then all the while the cows are feeding off of this and they're getting happy as well. Yeah. So and then basically the farmer will then move them around from area to area and you'll have now that like 5,000 acres in the case of the article that have been regenerated where it's primarily native plants, it's primarily, primarily beneficial plants, and they've almost weeded the landscape while also building the soil um, nice. and sequestering carbon during this whole process because this is something I also <laughs> want to get into, but in the uh, Emil DeVito had the question in the last episode, well, are native plants better at sequestering carbon? Yeah. Did a little research on that as well, which I'll, I guess I'll, I'll fill it in now. Okay. The, the short answer is, well, it's a, it's yes and no. Yeah. Plant per plant, are they better? Probably not, but it's yeah. actually the ecosystems and then the diversity of plants in that ecosystem that makes it a native landscape yeah. better versus a, a non-native landscape. And, and that was my thought you know overall that yeah this plant may be better than this plant but is it as beneficial yeah. overall so if you put it like a, a looking at uh, new jersey if you put a an inkberry holly versus a japanese barberry plant for plant there's probably not much of a different in, difference in how much carbon they sequester yeah. but if you have now a community where you have tall trees and then a, a bunch of japanese barberry underneath or you have a forest where it has inkberry holly and pitch pine and and all kinds of ground, uh, different forbs and, and, yeah. and grasses. Well, now you have all that diversity. You have different age structures. The roots of the native plants tend to be a little bit deeper growing than a lot of the yeah. non-natives. So that holds more, uh, more carbon in the soil versus above the soil. Yeah. Um, so that's what I found on that. And that's what's happening in these situations yeah. with these ranches is – you're getting this diversity of, of a prairie basically you're recreating this prairie a lot of tall grass prairie and because they have such deep root systems they're storing a lot of carbon sequestering that carbon underneath the ground and then rebuilding that soil and it becomes like a self-fulfilling thing as they go on where as the soil gets better because it's being grazed and and pastured the plants are then getting better 
which in turn makes the soil better and then makes the plants better. And all the while the cows are getting, are getting better nutrition the entire time too. And these cows are going for, for beef stock. Mm -hmm. Now there's some issues with that. They like, it's like agriculture makes up 10% of greenhouse yeah. gases mm -hmm. in the United States. And this is one way to reduce that impact, but there's some debate on whether sequestering carbon in the soil really makes that much of a difference. How much carbon can you actually sequester in the soil? Uh, so that was one of the issues that they mentioned. Yeah. We've um, seen some really interesting studies with native plants. And that you, I don't know if you remember, this may have been while you were still in college, but there was a, a doctor out of Spain mm -hmm. who developed a sewer treatment system out of cattail. Do you, do you remember that? I do so, remember so it was that. like floating pods, and they, mm -hmm. they basically floated these pods of cattails over the water so it could – uh, basically clean, fight, the water, clean the water, yeah. fight or remediate, and then they would harvest the uh, foliage. And I can't mm -hmm. remember how they were disposing of the foliage, but they would harvest the foliage, dispose yeah. of it, and then allow it to keep growing and, and filtering the water. But they were saying that it was better than some of the mechanical treatment plants. And I know one was installed in New York mm -hmm. probably like three years ago, four years ago. I just haven't heard anything about it yeah. recently. There was a, another project in the similar um, – using similar methodology to that and i can't remember it was a, a park in northeastern pennsylvania and i can't remember the name of the park but they were they planted basically a bunch of meadows and they would then it was a it was like a, a factory and it produced a lot of zinc mm -hmm. and the zinc smoke would then or i guess the smokestacks would actually blow and then hit this other slope Okay. So there's a lot of heavy metal deposits gotcha. on this opposite sm opposite slope, and they were trying to, when the slopes were bare, every time it rained, that was eroding and washing it right into the river, yeah. and that river fed into the Delaware River, fell and yeah. fed into the Atlantic Ocean. So you were basically just taking these heavy metals and contaminants and just pushing them downstream every time it rained. So they said, well, let's put some vegetation there to hold everything in place. Mm -hmm. The issue was they couldn't let it go into trees because – they were worried, okay, now these plants are going to suck up these heavy metals and store them in their, their trunks. Yeah. But if it gets in the leaves, the leaves drop, they yeah. wash into the streams, how much is going downstream. So they would actually burn it every year. And then they were worried, well, how much are we releasing in the smoke? Yeah. And there was a lot of concerns. And I don't I don't know where they are in that process. This was like 10 years ago you when know, I last heard about one, it. One person I would love to have on as a guest or a, a group, I don't know who the person would be, whoever's in charge of a meal brought up Liberty State Park and what mm -hmm. they're doing at yeah. Liberty State Park. And a lot of that was uh, irons and things like that from mm -hmm. the railroad. Um, and that's when they were saying it was behind fence because it was the old railroad that yeah. you were yeah. kind of pushed off. But I know a pioneer forest started growing there and they were using things like birch and they were finding out that I think it was gray birch was really good at taking those those metals out of the mm -hmm. soil. And I, I just don't know. And they're they're working on more restoration and I don't know where that science is went like yeah. what it led to yeah. so i'd love to have someone from liberty state park at some point just to talk about because that's such a mon monumental park as it is i would love to know more yeah. about that restoration but but that was a good sidetrack from, yeah from the there, there you go <laughs> well, with with this article in particular and this farm in particular they were finding that it was better grazing for the animals way less soil erosion they were losing less nutrients both in the soil and the plants and then they improved their rainfall of retention because these plants were so deep rooted, they kind of broke up oh, the packed awesome. soil. So the water would soak into the ground instead of running off and, uh, and going elsewhere. Um, and then on top of that, it was sequestering at least some carbon into the soil. Yeah. Um, the other, the last issue that they were thinking is, well, how, how scalable is this practice? We have a food system, especially with beef yeah. where you're taking lots of animals and cramming them into a tiny space to get them uh, as, as heavy as possible, as fast as possible, and then get them into your grocery store, which leads to uh, basically you have an inferior product in your grocery store versus this, but it costs so much less to do it that way that they're making more money doing it that way. Yeah. Um, where in this process, well, it takes a lot longer to raise that animal to get them, but they're having a better nutrition diet, which that nutrition is then passed on to the end consumer. You get a better product, a more flavorful product. So, and when you really think about it, this is what 
it used to be there. It wasn't cows. It was bison. But that's what happened with bison. That, you had an mm. article not that long ago where uh, but that's what oh, bison yeah. would do is they'd actually they'd walk over the plants and they'd squish some plants and yeah. the plants that were resilient would continue to grow. Yeah. And because um, they were finding even, in the trails like you could yeah. walk in their trails. They still exist today, even though the buffalo no yeah. longer roam them and it was more grains and things like that that survived mm -hmm. and that's where the food sources were coming yeah. that's where people kind of learned to mm -hmm. hey this is a farmable crop yeah. and there's even like a farm implement that mimics that and it actually like works as like a bunch of hooves that squash yeah. down the weeds and there's finding that a lot of these annual weeds just kind of fade off because they can't take that constant trampling where the perennials can yeah awesome so, yeah, awesome that's that a great article pretty cool and i'm hoping that people like that one there's a ton of articles to choose from but i didn't want to yeah. I, I i've said it before the one thing i do know is i have no idea which article <laughs> yeah, they're gonna like exactly but regardless of which one you can get with uh, this or you can get with that. i am you know what I you're give having up. a day i it's give okay. up i meant to say there can be only one <laughs> oh well it's too late so anyway <laughs> i guess do you have anything else to add to that before I close that out? No, no. Okay, all right. And of course, the choice is yours. All right. I feel like I kind of just totally ruined the momentum. Oh, it's one. okay. <laughs> we're, we're still doing good. Because this is the the main event yeah, of we, the episode. We, so. we, we don't have, or we did not receive any uh, phone call questions or any phone calls at all. Nothing from Saul. Saul's been quiet. Uh, the phone lines have been uh, quiet. It's when he said his quietest is when you got to worry. Wait, worry, you worry what's bit. coming next. <laughs> Maybe I should check in on him, make yeah. sure he's okay. <laughs> um, so, but this is really what we've been leading to is an exception. You know, the last, the last episode of the buzz that we did where we focused on Forbes was very well received. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we, we thought the next logical place to go from there would be graminoids. So, um, we, we kind of started off the last one with a definition. You yeah. know, just so yeah. in case you're you're unfamiliar with what a graminoid is, the the I guess the Webster's definition is an herbaceous plant with a grass like like morphology. Uh, for example, it's elongated combs with long blade like leaves. Uh, they are contrasted to Forbes um, herbaceous plants without grass like features. So um, examples of graminoids, and we're going to go into this as we go on: sedges, rushes, cattails, burr reed bulrushes and grasses they're just some different classifications and i, I keep joking every time i see this now i'm like sedges have edges rushes are yeah. i can't i, <laughs> I can't what, that's what i was just because i always forget the last part and that's grasses have knees that bend to the ground yeah there you and go and i always forget that part but that's um there's a lot of people who are surprised to find out that many of the grasses they know are not actually grasses that yeah. they're sedges or they're rushes yeah um and there is a difference yes and and that's kind of what we're going to talk about a little bit today i guess not necessarily the dishes but the, the differences but there are differences between these totally totally um so where do you want to start i guess we can go with um probably the the most uh i don't know if it's the craziest one but in my mind the craziest one is uh well I'm going to back up. Okay. We should probably talk cool season versus warm season. Yes. Because that's another defining factor. Yes. Um, specifically with, with grasses, you have your cool season grasses, your warm season grasses. Uh, cool season grasses are the ones that start to emerge when your soil temp gets around like 50 degrees. Some of the non-natives can take yeah. it cooler, like uh, especially your your traditional like um, uh, farm crop type grasses. Yeah. Uh, they'll take cooler temperatures. But Things like uh, Elemis virginicus or Virginia wild rye is a, a native cool season grass. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the first things to emerge. One of the reasons we use it as uh, for our seed business as almost like a native cover crop in a way, because it germinates pretty quick because you can seed early. It's one of the first things to germinate. You can seed later in the year. It'll still have the opportunity to germinate. Mm -hmm. And it kind of holds the rest of that seed in place because you get some, some vegetative cover. Yeah. Warm season grasses as you could probably infer, don't germinate when it's cool yeah. outside. So it's usually like end of spring, early summer. That's yeah. when you're starting to see those grains. Yeah. And that's, it's again, it's all dependent on where you live, and, when they're going to emerge. And it's a combination so. of heat and light. Mm -hmm. Like you can yeah. try to trick warm season grasses early by putting them in heat, but you really don't see a difference mm -hmm. until they're getting the amount of sunlight that they yeah, need. It's so it's, a, it's, it's, it's a day factor. length and intensity yeah. that really drives a lot of those yeah. grasses. And um, you, you know, what's interesting. And one, I'm not sure if it's classified. I'm going to 
I know we're going to bring up this plant later, but Spartina alterniflora, which is our sweet mm -hmm. cordgrass native bay grass, I whether it is or not, I kind of almost consider that plant a warm season grass because even though it may come up earlier, it kind of stalls until you know where we talked about daylight and intensity. Yeah, that one needs warm water, so it's not until the the water temperature mm -hmm. really heats up that that plant it, like it may be breaking dormancy and growing, but once it gets warm and that water warms up you can watch the roots grow at yeah. that point point. and it i just looked it up it is considered a warm season okay. grass some uh, other warm season grasses are a little blue stem which is schizocarium yeah. scoparium or how did how does uh steve castron schizacrium schizacrium i still haven't looked up i'm saying i have no idea but i like saying schizocarium yeah. because i can pronounce it yeah we even had uh <laughs> those shirts that said i, I have schizocarium scoparium yeah that was it uh, doesn't uh, sound as good if you say schizacrium scoparium doesn't sound know. as much it like could a be. I got disease. Schizacria. <laughs> <laughs> one of our one of our former employees, uh, their father in law loved botanical names, even though he wasn't in the business. Mm -hmm. So he thought that that one sounded like a disease. So yeah. he actually came up with graphics of it was like a uh, smiley face, face with like crazy grass with hair, little blue stem <laughs> yeah. hair. And it and it said I have schizacra. You know what? I'll wear it for the next. I yeah, have one. I'll I'll wear mine idea. for the next buzz episode. Maybe we have. To I should have wore it today. We should probably get the oh. rights to that. If we ever go the merch route, that <laughs> might have to be one. Of <laughs> I have schizacrium scoparium. Yeah. Ah. Um, but then it's like some other ones are well, big blue stem, which is Andropogon virginica or Andropogon gerardii, uh, Andropogon virginicus. Yes. Broom sedge is another one. So that's one thing to consider when if you're buying grasses for for your yard you got to know if it's warm season or cool season because that really dictates when they're going to come up yeah, and when exactly uh there's nothing worse than than looking down at the ground saying i thought i thought you'd be <laughs> here by now <laughs> when it's something you want to be up but all right so given that we can you want to go into a few and and we'll do like we did with the the forbs we'll just give a rundown of of some items maybe a couple brief things i'll yeah. try to remember common names yeah, exactly. more than likely i'm <laughs> not just, going i was to... gonna say we might just turn into a ramble where we're <laughs> jumping all over the place I may, again but this this segment may be tom's turn to to just be the host where i was just sitting yeah. here trying to think of stuff and i'm i'm i'm, I'm not so, i'm not doing so good today but uh but yeah these are some of the the more popular genuses of these plants and then there's a whole bunch of different species in each genus um so let's start with carex Yes. And Carex, you can really kind of delineate there's upland versions of Carex yes. and there's wetland versions of Carex. If, the, if this wasn't already complicated already, <laughs> um, some of the more popular upland ones are Carex Pennsylvanica is probably the most, the popular, most popular upland yeah. one, at least on the East Coast. Um, and that's because it takes shade, it likes it dry. Can take uh, it sandy. Takes it's, it sandy. Um, and it stays small. Can take some foot traffic. Yeah. Uh, you see a lot of people, especially uh people in the new jersey pine barrens where they have shady dry sandy yards and they don't want to mow well they'll plant yeah. this and yeah. now you don't have to mow it's not like you're really walking on your front yard in a lot of cases anyway um but you don't want like your kids running around and playing on it and you're putting a trampoline on top and yeah throwing down the slip and slide it's not going to take that <laughs> it's, that's not going to work but if it's something where you let the pets out every once in a while or you walk across the front front yard to get your Sunday paper, yeah. it can take that kind of yeah. traffic. Yeah. And um, it's also really good in a lot of garden beds, uh, along with, with I should mention, Carex Appalachia is yeah. the other one I was thinking of because it doesn't get very tall, stays really probably in less than eight inches, definitely less than a foot. Um, kind of gets a little bit tufty, I guess is a way to yeah. put it. And it can form as... Uh, cloudy west i'm pretty sure alluded to it can form that ground cover layer if you plant it yes. dense enough and then you can have your your uh you don't have to mulch but you can have that more spaced outlook yeah and it kind of um, gives you like a hair like a hair type yeah the, feel to it like it's the it, blades it are very thin yeah so yeah um and that is a sedge that those, is those the characters those are, are sedges they're, yes so. so so those are the upland sedges so mm -hmm. and then you have the wetland uh classification too so um you know i think carrick strict or tussock sedge is a good mm -hmm. one to start with only because it, it forms a tussock it is an obligate um it, but it can also take six inches of permanent inundation mm -hmm. so it, it can be in a very swampy boggy area and and be inundated and it forms these big tussocks that yeah. are very you know that you, you notice them right away um, which if you like the hunt that's like and yeah. you, especially if you like the duck hunt 
it does it's an awesome place because it kind of you can hide behind it yeah um there's just it provides so many opportunities for wildlife uh and not just ducks but all kinds of different wetland animals whether it's otters and just other things that like those those wet conditions and a lot of these wetland ones that we're talking about you're looking at a max height of two to three foot yeah. so there's then you're into the facultative wets you have lurids lurid sedge um fox sedge bladder sedge which is carex intimensis which has a really cool uh, mm -hmm. um uh, what's the word i'm looking seed for head? seed head yeah. yeah it's got a very cool seed head fringe sedge there's a lot you know and the thing is we're naming all these sedges if you were to put them all together some of these you would have a really hard time yeah i've, out. I've seen some botanists well, who can't even identify well, between the two unless you see the seed head where it comes cases. down to the flower stalk yeah. the the height of the flower stalk like the blades are exactly the same but this one the flower stalk gets two inches mm -hmm longer than the flower stalk of this one it's it's really difficult to id some of these um so you, you know you want to make sure it, if you're going walking through wetlands and you see you may be able to pick out bladder sedge or you may mm -hmm. be able to pick out uh Lurid fox sedge, sedge. Fox yeah. Sedge, yeah you know it's just it, it gets really difficult i'm not i'm not 100 percent when i'm out looking at them it, it comes like i said it's <laughs> it, We've had to have botanists sometimes yeah. come out and say this one's this for this reason, mm -hmm. this one's this for that yeah. reason. So, so another uh, species or group of species of plants that's really great for uh, especially wildlife is your Spartinus, yeah. which are, are might not be called Spartina anymore, but we're still going to call, call them Spartina on this episode. Yes. But uh, you think of a lot of your salt marsh species, so mm -hmm. your your low marsh, which is uh, Spartina alterniflora um which is smooth cord grass yeah. and a, so, a grass in this case so that that has to be in the tide twice a day so mm -hmm. it's in the tidal zone so it's wet and dry twice a day so and it's pretty specific and it takes pretty wide range of salinity and it can mm -hmm. even take the thing is it can take fresh water it just gets out compete it it, it likes being in salt water yeah. but i think it takes up to 35 parts per thousand yeah so oh yeah it can take up to seawater but like like you were just saying it can grow in fresh water and um it, yeah, it just you just don't see it there. Yeah, water. yeah. But uh, one of the really big benefits of how this grows is again, it kind of forms those those like uh, I don't want to call it. Uh, I can't think of the term again. But if they grow in in clusters, I guess is okay, the best yeah. way to put it. So you'll have these gaps in between the almost the like rhizomal communities, yeah. almost yeah. And that's where you have some of your best. Uh, like it's your fish nursery, I guess yeah. is a way to put crabs, it. And I crabs. Think crabs. So if you like to fish, especially if you're liking to fish in the ocean uh, on the East Coast, um, striping, striper fishing or rockfish fishing is is super popular. Well, a lot of the stripers actually, some of them, their nesting habitat is in these Spartina marshes. Yeah. And uh, and they just really love. They can hide in those little areas in between in between the plants where the yeah. water's only there for, for part of the day but they can hide in there and get the water gets a little bit warmer it's really really great habitat for so many things and then you see all the shorebirds that are going in and herons and all kinds of stuff yeah. that that's you just put a buffet right in yeah their totally face where they couldn't get to it otherwise. totally so that's a really cool species when you get into the upper marsh that's when you have spartina right. patens. patens yeah and disticlus um, spicata which is mm -hmm. those two kind of go hand in hand in most high marshes here in the mm -hmm. along the the coastal plain of yeah. the eastern united states you Again, have, have a salt tolerance in that case yeah they actually are, are are i think they go up to 50 parts per thousand and they're just so they're getting lunar tides they're getting storm tides yeah. they're occasionally inundated but more than likely they're just above the high tide and mark. that's why they can well they're able to tolerate those higher conditions is you get that flood and you get all that salt water but now it starts to dry down well the water leaves but the salt, salt does doesn't yeah so that's why they can tolerate higher uh, salinity and you also have spartina sinusoroides uh which is it's a little bit i, I guess it's it's high tide too but it's mm -hmm. it could take it a uh, you know like maybe where it's it's not getting completely dry and it gets a little bit taller as well yeah so yeah and that um, one can get very tall where the yeah. other ones i guess uh, alternative floor is like is probably two to this, three yeah. maybe i i yeah, i know there's i don't know if it's debate or fact that there's a smaller version that can maybe take a little pooling or mm -hmm. or larger larger ones but on average two to three foot for smooth cord grass and then sinus sororities gets five to six foot i want to say yeah it might even get taller, taller. than that yeah. um but then again, when I'm saying that, I'm usually in a boat, so yeah. <laughs> it looks really big. But um, 
And then, but you also have an inland species, at least mm-hmm. one. There's probably more, but the one I'm aware of is uh is your uh oh now I'm forgetting what it's called. Is it prairie prairie cord grass, prairie cord grass yeah. yeah, which is Spartina pectinata. We yeah. had to we had to look that we, that's the one that we could remember the common name, but we couldn't remember the yeah the botanical <laughs> yeah. name on it. We had to but, and uh, we grow it too. I know that one's actually getting fairly popular with a lot of these um habitat managers who are managing for deer because it perf- um, forms a really good screen for them to walk in and out of the property without being seen or, or their wind blowing through them and blowing their scent all around and scaring away the game. And and that kind of leads us into the the next one we're going to talk about, which is Spirobolus, because they just recently reclassified all Spartina to Spirobolus, which is interesting when you think of prairie cord grass and then prairie drop seed, which is Spirobolus hepteropolis, I believe. I That's close enough for me. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm not as familiar with that's one I'm not I, I'm not well versed enough to yeah. really talk yeah talk it's something about. that's native here but again some of our our exposure is limited to things that we grow yeah so it's uh it's one of the things that we've actually both been talking about getting out of and making sure we're we're going to do some more plant id this this yeah. uh this spring and summer and fall um just because this podcast really inspired us and said oh man there's so much that we don't know that we would need to get out and, and do so yeah totally so um and yeah, I, I've been doing that more and more. Like every time I, I can't go anywhere and walk and not try to ID the plant in my head. Like mm-hmm. it's just a constant, like that is yeah. this. or yep. um, so. so next we have uh, uh, river sea oats, which is mm-hmm. Chasmanthium latifolium. So that's really like a, a floodplain uh, northern, I think it's northern sea oats is mm-hmm. the, the botanical name. Um, yeah. It's a floodplain, I think a facultative wet. Um, but it gets a seed head that's very similar to the Uniola paniculata, which is sea oats, which you see, it's, which is a dune plant mm-hmm. in the south. So it's um, different blade look, but it's 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 got a wider blade and it's dark green, but it gets that that sea oats seed head, which is mm-hmm. they they kind of droop. It's 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 an it's interesting flat, right? Yeah, and then it's then a very flat seed head. Almost looks mm-hmm. like um. I guess similar to a rattlesnake rattle in a yeah. way, but it's yeah. flat. Yes. It's it's really cool. It's a really cool landscape plant because of that texture that it provides. Yeah. So yeah. uh then some other really good landscape plants that are, are pretty popular are your the champsias, um, yeah. both wavy and tufted hair grass, which are uh flexuosa is the wavy hair grass and cespitosa is the tufted hair grass. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And those are both upland, I believe, mm-hmm. like upland, more clumping, uh almost like a like a poor soil quality type like a like a dry nutrient deficient soil if i remember correctly i'm, I'm mm-hmm. not again this is another one i'm not super familiar with i know the plant and can id it yeah. but it's it's more like a, a clumping open area mm-hmm. uh plant but it's, it's it has a great look really thin uh blades that the wavy uh hair grass is a really cool uh very cool look it's and it's hair like so hair grass is, is a great great name for it um yeah. and then we have schizacrium uh which is or schizacarium however you want to say it which I, is so i actually well, I, I saw this coming up and i looked it up is there a way we can play this on the air uh if it could, we gotta we gotta solve this once it, for all we're gonna keep saying if it. you move your microphone over to uh, I, I, you know what can you we, have your microphone off maybe yeah. i'll bring it up all right hold on all right hold but on. It, the the pronunciation uh, guys because skits uh cure Oh, I can't. Right, I don't gonna, know how to I'm actually phonetic. gonna Google it on my phone to see. <laughs> we gotta put this to bed because it's just gonna keep driving us nuts. All right, let's see. Pronunciation. Oh, this is the guy that does the funny thing. So that's what it's like wearing regular uh, shoes. Oh, no oh. all around support. It's all the comfort. All right, Skechers, you just got free ad play on our on it's our podcast. Support. Try Skechers Arch. All right. Nitrous certified arch support. All right. Thank God that was the ad yeah. and not something worse. There it is. Let's see. Schizacarium. Oh. I never thought that we would have been right. No, schizacarium. Okay, all right. There you, there you have it. That's our. <laughs> all right, schizacarium. Oh, yeah. Whether they're right or not, who knows? Yeah, it's a YouTube yeah. video. Who knew? I thought this was the guy that does the funny pronunciations uh, that uses yeah. it in a comical way. I was like, oh, I don't know if we should be playing this. Um, so you have uh, 
scoparium, which is a little blue stem, mm-hmm. which is characterized. It, it could be anywhere from like a greenish blue to a blue two to three foot tall, uh, small clumping uh, grass can be mm-hmm. very striking. You, you get the genetic diversity and, and uh, the seed diversity where some are really strikingly blue, some not so blue. There's a lot of varieties on the trade or cultivars, I think, ovation because it's supposed to Mm-hmm. not draw and there's the blues um which is another one that's very popular yeah. but and you also have littoral which is um coastal uh blue stem so it, mm. it, it has a higher salt tolerance i think mm. little blue stem has a salt tolerance anyway it's used at the at the uh on coastal situations but littoral is more common in the mm. in the dunes and I, that was when like i actually just i'll bring this up now i just finished building our website last week yeah uh it launched this week um it's kind of like a soft launch i guess you would say yeah. but that was when i was building the website i was surprised at how many plants actually did have some kind of salt tolerance where it was yeah. just salt spray up to again like higher than seawater yeah um it was amazing i think just for the plants that could take some kind of salt spray that we grow there was like 44 different species yeah it's amazing so it pretty it, cool yeah it's, it is amazing so you want to go the next one yeah so uh i'm actually going to skip ahead okay. and say that uh, Schizocarium scoparium used to be called Andropogon scoparius yes. because it was in a different family, uh, that being the Andropogons, which the two I'm most familiar with are uh, Gerardi and Virginicus. Virginicus yes. They have big blue stem and then uh, broom sedge, which oh, I think we talked about them earlier. But uh, broom sedge looks very familiar to little blue stem, actually. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, uh, definitely a color difference, you know, but it's a height and kind of look are very, very, very mm-hmm. similar. And the three, the the schizocarium and then that, those two, Andrew Pogan, both tend to like it drier. Yeah. Um, you see it a lot, or the the broom sedge, you see, and the little blue stem, you see a ton in the New Jersey pine barrens, where it's yeah. dry, sandy. Yeah. Um, the big blue stem, <clears throat> you see, you probably it's probably native there as well. I just haven't noticed it, I guess I yeah. can say. But both of but, those are, or all three of those are, are deep rooted, very deep rooted. Uh, mm-hmm. Um grasses yeah. or grammars yeah. then you have uh what's it? andropogon glomeratus is another one that that i'm not as familiar with and i can't remember the the common name of that uh, is that bushy bushy blue stem i think bearded blue stem bearded, something, something along bushy blue lines, stem yeah. because the fluorescence that um give you that bearded look yep. almost yep. so it's 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 a little more clumping and that's that's a pretty pretty interesting looking one i think that one's more wetland mm-hmm. than it's it takes it likes it more wet than yeah than dry so and then uh going back we have our panicums yes um yes. which can both take salt tolerance as well yeah panicum brigadum uh which is that that's that's really can be riverbank i can't remember if that has an inundation if it is it's short it's too so. now yeah. but um and panicum amarum which is really more of a, a dune grass yeah. uh coastal mm-hmm. coastal panic grass and there's there's Amarum and Amarulum, which mm-hmm. is one is supposed to be truly two to three foot tall and one is supposed to be five foot tall. So there's mm-hmm. a difference. It's the same plant, just a variety which stays shorter um, than the other one. Um, you have Sardastrum uh, newtons, mm-hmm. uh, which is Indian grass. So a little bit taller. Yeah. I'm trying to remember. Is that I, I can't remember the wetland indicator status on that I one. I think but it's facultative. Facultative. It might be fac up. It's somewhere remember. in the middle. It's 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 in the middle, but it's more of a traditional taller. To me, like that would be a great replacement for like uh, miscanthus. Like if you're mm-hmm. looking yeah. at invasive yeah. plants that you're trying to eliminate, uh, sergastrum I think would be a better or panicum. Yeah. There's a lot of panicum brigadum. I think there's cloud nine. There's Oh, blue. There's, yeah. there's, there's the so heavy many. metal. There's blue varieties, green varieties. There's like a purple variety, I think, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. all, all over the place. So you can. And I think at one point on the podcast, I told the story. Um, they were talking about uh, provenance plants, of ecotype of plants. Yeah. And it was taking, it was, uh, I'm pretty sure it was Panic for Game Dallas Blues. And they brought it and put it in a place where it had, so well, it was discovered in Texas. Yeah. Um, and it was a, a cultivar but it wasn't a propagated cultivar i guess so it was a selection i guess is the right yeah. term but uh they took it well in texas they didn't get a lot of rainfall they took it put it someplace where it did get a lot, a lot of rainfall the purpose of dallas blues is it stayed upright stayed a little bit shorter and when they put it where it got a lot of rainfall and I, some someone reach out to me and correct me if yeah. they say oh no this isn't the case but this is what i was told um 
and they put it where they had a lot of rainfall and it got just as tall and flopped over like the panic of I'm did. pretty sure that's so, correct yeah. you know it's I may have seen that in a trial garden somewhere where they mm -hmm. said a, a very similar thing to that so if I remember correctly like a trial garden in the yeah. northeast but going back to the sorghum that's probably one of my favorite plants and uh, I'm going to throw out uh, or give a shout out to a new Facebook group I came across called uh, Native Habitat Managers okay. that started by, uh, in part by one of the listeners of this podcast as well. And, um, but that, if you're looking at big properties, they give a lot of tips about burning and all that. But one of the things they threw out is, hey, what are some good replacements for, for giant miscampus? Because it is invasive and there's a lot of issues. And if yeah. you go to basically any i shouldn't say any but most places that are saying oh how to turn your property in the midwest to a white hip, white tail haven they say you got to plant giant mist campus as a, as a screening so you can get in and out without the deer knowing you're there and it's an ecological problem it's it's yeah. really is negligent of the people who are saying that because they're advertising to create a problem you know and and honestly that is that has been known to have been a problem and invasive yeah for at least 25 years when I was at mm -hmm. the Connor Powell company, actually Angela Treadwell, who, who, you know, as well, mm -hmm. yep. took it out of our production mix at that point, because she was like, they're finding studies that this is invasive. We really need to be proactive and take this out of yep. our mix. And yep. at that point, and that was a huge seller for us at that point. Mm -hmm. And we were very proactive at removing that and purple loose strife and things like that, that were still popular in the trade. Yeah. So, I mean, we've known that plant's been an issue forever and you can still, you can still easily fly, find that plant. Oh yeah, uh, and that's at, like, at uh, most at most uh, chain stores or, or or garden centers. And that's if you're if you're interested to learn more about uh, that group and and more about the how bad giant mythcanthus is. Um, the fellow who's listening to us is is Kyle Larbarger, and I'm probably butchering his last name, but um, but he's uh, based out of Alabama or Tennessee, I think, and he's been putting up all kinds of stuff saying that there's all these companies that are saying, oh yeah, these are the best natives to choose from, but they still sell giant miscanthus <laughs> yeah. and advertise giant miscanthus. And he's like, you can't have it both ways. No. You're trying to, but you're giving people so many different pieces of information that are pulling them in different directions. And um, it's really just makes you look like you're out to make a buck yeah. and you're getting people to cause an ecological problem. So a um, little sidetrack there, but we'll, <laughs> we'll move along. Some, here's some of the, the last couple that, um, or just some of the ones that we like, uh, Trident's Flavus or Purple Top, yeah. uh, similar to the the Purple Lovegrass, which yeah. we mentioned before, which is actually next on our list. Yep. Um, they both, Purple Lovegrass stays lower, the Trident's gets a little bit taller, probably about four feet, yeah. but they both get that kind of um, purplish cloud on top yeah. with the seed heads. They're pretty cool to, to see. You know, we've really focused, you know, we, we talked about salt marsh and mm -hmm. we've, we've talked about a lot of upland grasses because I think that's what a lot of people think, but you have you have wetland grasses too. You have the the wild rye, the Virginia yeah. wild rye, the Riverbank wild rye, um, Canadian uh, wild rye, and also like a a, a moist shade loving um, is Calamagrostis canadensis. Um, mm -hmm. Why am I drawing a blank on the common name of that? It's um, I knew oh, it was going to yeah. happen. <laughs> I knew it was going to happen. Yeah. So uh, I'll look it up. Yeah, I or Canadian. I, I can't remember. Oh well. So. Tom's going to look it helps it when I'm actually typing. In the yeah. Keyboard, huh? um, but that's a great, you know, and you also have uh, rice cut grass, which is Lyrzia orozoides, which can take six inches of permanent inundation. Uh, it's called cut grass because if you yeah. try to like grab it by the blades, you're going to slice your hand. So Calamagrostis candensis, according to our website, is blue joint grass. Thank you. I couldn't <laughs> remember blue joint, but that's a great, uh, it, it can tolerate shade and also moist conditions. So that's a, gr a great, uh, suggestion we didn't even talk about bull rushes no yeah. which is uh it's, also in that thing or rushes in general like, yeah we didn't we, go over i had the rushes at the very very end yeah it's uh, just... <laughs> well i think we should point out you had uh red top in there trident's flavus mm -hmm. um and Budalua. Budalua? is that that's another one i don't know how to pronounce no but that's but... got an awesome seed head on it that's very that stands out whenever i see it in a garden that's yeah. something i wish we grew and that's another uh uh, well, the Cydos Gramma yeah. is uh, one. Yeah, I think that's something we should probably add to our mix at yeah. some point. But then you have buffalo grass, yeah. which is really uh, – it's more native to the south – southern Midwest, like Texas through probably like Missouri, Kansas. Yeah. It's really native in that area. But that they recommend is like a turf grass alternative. Yeah. So, again, similar to the Cactus Pennsylvania, except I think this is even – 
better for for foot traffic yeah so yeah a lot of the rushes that i'm familiar with um and uh that we sell you have soft rush which is an extremely popular two to three foot a lot mm -hmm. of times you'll see that intermingling with car with lurid sedge um naturally or, or hibiscus mm -hmm. you kind of see those kind of playing together the conditions yeah. but it's it, it, it likes saturation it doesn't like inundation but then then you're going into a, a bunch that are going to take inundation and freshwater saltwater um uh green bull rush uh long stem bull rush uh like scurpus tabernae montanii i just like saying that yeah, one. yeah. <laughs> which was is it's actually shanoplectus i'm sorry mm -hmm. so it's they that's another reclassification scurpus yeah. is now shanoplectus so uh, Shanoplectus tabernae montanii. There's a lot of great selections. In yeah, there you have too. like Shanoplectus atrovirens, uh, which is the green. Um, Cyprinus is wool grass. Yeah, wool grass, and uh, and that's a really cool one. Yeah, just for the seed head. If you have some kind of wetland or, or a pond or stream on your property, yeah. that's something that looks really cool because it gets um, a woolly seed head. Yeah, why it's called wool grass. Yeah, and you also have burries too, yeah. uh, the sparganium. So you have lesser and greater, which mm -hmm. is uh, pure carpum and americanum. So it's one is shorter than the other, but that's another one that takes, I think, up to twelve inch, inches of inundation. It has a really interesting flower. It lives kind of like right on that edge of of waterways. We used to have it right around our pond, right by the yeah. the dock. Yeah. I don't think it's there anymore. I don't know what happened to it, but that's another uh, great alternative. So, is so, there is there any more you want to go into oh my i'm sure we could go into ton ton. let us know what we forgot yeah but before we move on uh one we meant i had a note in there to talk about turf grass alternatives oh yes which i mentioned the the carex pennsylvania carex appalachia yeah. and then that buffalo grass those depending on where you are that's where you kind of want to look um and nothing's going to mimic what we normally have for your turf grass your your yeah. kentucky blue but which isn't non-native no, but and most of the, most of the stuff is non-native to, to me you get a more wild inviting look like to me a manicured lawn is not inviting it, it's saying stay yeah. off to yeah. me where a wild look makes me want to it's inviting and makes me want to mm -hmm. explore through it so like i'd rather see a patch of carex pensilvanica mm -hmm. as a as a lawn rather than than any turf grass yeah that's yeah. my personal preference but so, if you had to pick out a handful of these for people to because grass is really are underutilized in home gardens yeah if you had to pick out a handful what would you pick for people to, to at least do some research on and maybe use at home you know i think uh switchgrass is great as a backdrop mm -hmm. uh especially when it flowers uh even if you want to go with a cultivar you know i prefer the straight species but um it gives you a nice backdrop uh same with the uh uh, what's the one I'm thinking of? I have to go back and look. But anyway, if you move on to smaller stuff, I think little blue stem, mm -hmm. it gives you, it can be a standalone. It doesn't have to be clustered. It's great as a clustered. I've actually seen little blue stem, even though it's an upland used in rain gardens to, as a velocity yeah. break, yep. uh, where the water is coming in, they may use stone and little blue stem just to kind of like break up that water energy before it hits the, mm -hmm. the ground. And it, you know, it works well in clumps. It works well on its own. Those two, I think, easily would be the first two. Um, uh, Budalea is is one mm -hmm. that we don't grow, but I think is a nice looking specimen. That that seed head is so distinctive that it, it goes well in most gardens because uh, of the texture. It's got such a great texture that you can really layer it. It's shorter, and you can it can be one of those front layers. Mm -hmm. um, and and play with 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 Pennsylvania sedge definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah whether it be a ground cover at the at the base of a garden or uh as in patches of lawn yeah i think oh, yeah. i think any of those the one thing if you're using pennsylvania sedge it is a very slow grower mm -hmm. most things on average you can space anywhere from a foot to two feet on center if you're doing pennsylvania sedge you have to go closer it's like six to eight inches on center because it will take forever to fill in if yep. you don't do that mm -hmm. it 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 it, divide, it it doesn't really produce a viable seed unless it it's set to fire and it you know it 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 doesn't it, it doesn't take over mm -hmm. it's not like it's it's not extremely aggressive it's very slow yeah so those would be how about you what would you recommend that's i was going to say the the pennsylvania sedge is one just to, for that filler and if you uh if you go back to claudia west claudia west episode i know she mentioned another Carrick's that was probably even better filler yeah and ground I, and cover I but I, I always forget um uh 
I like the Trident's flavor. That was the one I was trying to think of. And with the one pan that I didn't add to our list before we started, and because really because it's not, it's a native grass, but it's not native here, is the uh, Muhlenbergia capillaris. Yeah. Just because it has a really good, if you want something that's showy and fits that's uh, like a more formalish garden. That's, that's a, a good one. Muley grass. Uh, pink muley pink grass. Muley yeah. grass. Yeah. And there's, if you're into the varieties, there's some really cool varieties that are like extra pink and extra like pink cloudy. It's, it's a pretty cool uh, species to yeah. work with. So we just, we, we just listed a, a, a slew of great native plants. The the ones that you want to stay away from are Japanese silver grass. Any mm-hmm. the, anything in the miscanthus uh, family yeah. are bad. Uh, Japanese bloodgrass, which is Imperata cylindrica rubra, really bad. You know, a lot of people, you don't see it as much today. It was it was short, like a foot to two foot tall, and blood red, and people mm-hmm. love that. And they found that that is extremely invasive. Also, um, that disappeared quicker than than uh, 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 Japanese silver grass. But mm-hmm. try to please stay away from those. Those are exotic invasives that are not good for yeah. our habitat at all. One thing I forgot to bring up is. Most people, when they think pollinators, think about the forbs, forbs and all yeah. your flowers. But the grass, well, the graminoids are really important as well. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of, also there's a lot of insects and pollinators that either they'll overwinter in the stems, they use them for larval stage forage mm-hmm. and, and what they'll, basically what the larval stages are eating. Uh, they'll lay their eggs on them. And if you don't have those species, um, you don't have those insects in a lot of cases. There's a lot of specialist insects that need those grasses, or I keep calling them grasses. That's one of the issues that, yeah. <laughs> that I have. Maybe this could be your complaint. No, <laughs> uh, if people are using grasses uh, and graminoids uh, interchangeably. No, but because, you, know, you, you know, you also have cover. You know, yeah. ducks use uh, some of these uh, mm-hmm. graminoids for cover. It's there's a lot of uses. I'm, and we know Spartina grasshoppers love yep. Spartina. Yep. They 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 go to town uh and, and a marsh yeah. if you're there like they'll eat the seed uh mm-hmm. before we can even oh, yeah. collect it so you know there they, there's a lot of benefit to the food chain for all of these species yeah when you when you think about oh just our herbaceous plants as a whole one side the forbs aren't necessarily better than the graminoids the graminoids aren't necessarily better than the forbs and if you can't really go with one and not the other you need yeah. both and it doesn't just have to be the sexy, you know, mm-hmm. you know, it's like the monarchs or, or things like that. It's there's a ton of, of food web um, uh, and cover and foraging and yeah. everything to be yeah. said in these these graminoids. So they're an important part. You mm-hmm. should really, you know, because we're going to do trees and we're also going to do shrubs. Y- you really need to have the full capacity of all of these. You shouldn't just use oh, one yeah. or not. Yeah. You know, there should be a blend of these because in, in most good natural healthy ecosystems and natural spaces you, you have a nice mix mm-hmm. of these yeah exactly you know anywhere from you know any part of the successional forest so yeah so. this is fun i, I like yeah. do, i like doing this i do too this is kind of some of what we do uh, a little bit of what we do in the office but some of what we do at trade shows when you get a little bunch around or around a bunch of plant geeks mm-hmm. um and it's there's probably there's probably a lot to take away it's sometimes it turns into just us rambling for, well, 90, for 90, i don't know half an hour 90, how long do we go 90 percent of this is yeah. ad-libbed you yeah. know we're not scripting this we just wrote yeah. down some plants to remember some mm-hmm. some genus to remember and, yeah. and and we're going in there so we we're actually i didn't think it would be that long we're actually almost an hour and 10 minutes okay so yeah so. well since you don't have a complaint this week I don't, thank, you know, thank God that we don't have to, you know, <laughs> to that you again. know, <laughs> not that I'm one to complain, you know, and it makes me happy that I don't have a complaint, but I remember after the last buzz, I actually had a complaint and I ran it by it and I didn't write it down and I, yeah, it was yep. fleeting. It, it went with the wind. I lost it. So that's good. I, you know, it, I don't want it to always have something negative. I like mm-hmm. that this one's more positive and then yeah, I have nothing to complain about. Definitely. Although so, I'm sure I complained about something. Yeah. And it's just <laughs> Yeah. But as you guys know, we like to wrap up each episode with uh, kind of a spur of the moment activity. Let's break out the pod deck and see what it has we, for us this week. We got them. And I actually remembered to bring them in this time. Yeah. So we actually have, we have them here. These are the ones that we've, wow. Look at how many we've, we've actually like covered. Wow. We've actually yeah. done all those. So, all right. Gotta pick one out here. I fanned them out. We have 
<laughs> throwback Thursday. It's, it's actually Wednesday. When this is airing on a Friday, but <laughs> yeah. Throwback Thursday, share your most embarrassing moment. Oh gosh, we should keep it industry related. Yeah, we should yeah. keep it industry related. So, I'm trying to think. I have so many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to think of one that's industry related. That's uh, that I guess there was. There's two, and as if you guys couldn't tell by our remembering plant names, I'm also not good at remembering people's names and i'm constantly calling people the wrong name but um i had uh this is when i was in grad school i was giving a presentation and we went on a tour we were actually developing as a class a site plan for a um uh a wetland restoration it's actually an inland salt marsh outside of syracuse new york and it was a place where groundwater was going down and touching these salt beds that were way underground i forget how many feet underground and then as it came back to the surface it would percolate through and it would have a salinity to it and actually be salt and um and syracuse historically was known as the salt city because they had um uh because of these basically these salt deposits that were underground and uh and that's where a lot of the nation's or east coast salt came from back in the day but anyway we're looking at this restoring the salt marsh it had a lot of um um invasive plants there and they were basically looking at tearing this whole thing out yeah. but anyway we developed this whole project plan we figured out what would grow what we came up with the plants that we were going to advise on the grow and actually i i tony leonardo was involved oh, yeah. in this okay who's right. um a friend of ours as well yeah. and last time i talked to him i think they actually went through not with our plan but, yeah. <laughs> but they went through and actually did this restoration um but uh we did and i was thanking the the people only one of the people showed up um to the to the event or uh, this presentation and i was thanking i was like the mc and i was thanking him and i called him the wrong name oh. and i think i called him tony and his name was something else i don't even remember what it oh. was and the same thing happened i was doing a site visit and uh thankfully i'd never met the guy before and i kind of we i wasn't there to meet him i just knew he was someone important there and i said oh yeah how, how you doing you're rob right and he's like no i'm scott I'm like, oh okay so i'm thinking of someone else but then i wasn't i was just as i was walking by i was introducing myself and that was it uh, and then when i went back i'm like oh i'm thinking of my friend's friend who works in the same field and his name's rob and i knew this guy's name was scott I just blanked when i said it so that's my embarrassing moment not my pants didn't fall down anywhere and anything like so, that. So mine, my, mine is, <clears throat> I'm going back. It was my first year here at the nursery. So it was, I started in August of 2007. So it was April of 2008. And <clears throat> when I came here from Princeton Nurseries, I had a good relationship with some customers that we could benefit from here, even though it was two different businesses, there was crossover. So one of one of the guests, and actually this can come up because they're going to be a future guest on a rooted discussion, mm -hmm. is Jim McKenzie of Octorero Native Plant Nursery. So um, we were finally doing business with them um, here, and 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 we put together a really nice order, and and it was going to be the start of a great relationship. So um, he got his first delivery that April, and he he called me and was extremely upset with the plant material he goes this is not what you told me this is not what i expected i don't think we can have a relationship i'm i think i'm gonna have to if this is what you're sending me i'm gonna have to cancel the rest of the order so i'm panicking like i'm like i haven't even been here a year i brought in an account i just lost this account i'm i'm sweating bullets you know and i'm i'm mustering up the courage and i'm like i have to you know, talk to talk to your parents about this. I have to talk to Don. I have to talk to Suzanne. So I talked to them, and they were equally concerned that this wasn't how they expected it to go. And I'm, I'm sinking here. So I have to call Jim back, and I'm groveling, and I'm like, "What is it I can do?" And he's like, "What's today?" And I'm like, "It's it's like Tuesday." And he goes, "But what's the date?" And I'm like, "April 1st. And he's like, "Well, what's the what's the date?" And I'm like, April 1st. And he goes, well, what is today? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, it's April Fool's Day. <laughs> so apparently your dad had contacted yeah. Jim and told him just to completely roast me. And he, he I, I sweat it for a good hour to two hours trying to figure out this dilemma and what was going on. And it was – everyone was in on it. Everyone knew but me. And it was just <laughs> – it was – it was. I thought I was getting ready to take – you know, hand my, my playbook in and go home. Yeah, and it was yeah. a great – is a great April Fool's 
fool's day joke by everyone in the industry. So it was, and we talk about that all the time. Oh yeah. It was, yeah. It, was, it still comes up. <laughs> so it was, that was my, cause I was so embarrassed. Like when it finally came out, I was just like, you know, that's, that was a fun one. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it I'm was stressful. Say, yeah. Neither of ours are that bad. I'm sure no. there's some people who, who've had way, way <laughs> worse embarrassing you, moments. You know, I, I'm trying to think I, I never got, drunk in an industry you know mm. there's listen with you go to enough trade shows as we go to you see enough people get drunk and and make an embarrassment mm. of themselves yep. uh, we've seen fist fights oh, yeah. <laughs> you know That's... we've seen we've seen all kinds of crazy things um you know but fortunately we haven't we haven't been a yeah. part of any of yeah. that so so we have better judgment I yes guess, we so do so <laughs> which is surprising yeah. Surprise. yeah. and now if my mom was it was to answer that for me she probably would have said how i made a weed joke at the beginning of this episode <laughs> 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 yeah you know i'm sure i'm, I'm sure it's somewhere at a, at a speaking engagement or something yeah. i made a comment that probably wasn't well received or something like that yeah. but i can't i can't think of anything else off the top of my head no probably. yeah that's I think we both had two, probably realistically, they're probably two of the more embarrassing moments that we've had. We haven't yeah. had anything too bad happen to us because no. I think we overall, just as Pinewoods Nursery, we have better judgment when it comes to a lot of things. And, yeah. yeah, um, totally. We, we pride ourselves on being honest and being upfront with what we're capable yeah. of. So it's, yeah. I know there's situations where people say, oh yeah, I'll, I'll deliver all these plants and they're going to be this big by this date. And then the truck never shows up and, they just yeah. took a whole bunch of money because yeah. they knew they couldn't do it. But yeah, if we tell you something yeah. where, and that was being in sales, that was one of the things that I loved about coming here because I've never, never, ever been put in a situation to, to lie about something. It's mm -hmm. always, you put forward the information, you give them all your knowledge, the best thing. And if you don't think something's right, don't take the order. You know, mm -hmm. it's, you want, yeah. you want to be part of a successful project. Yeah. No one wants to be the reason that a project fails. And, and in past experience, you get put in situations where you find yourself not being the most reputable mm -hmm. when it comes to sales. So it's, I, I, I love the fact that I've never been put in that situation here and I know I never will be, you know, it's just, that's, that's how we are. Mm -hmm. That's yep. as an organization. Mm -hmm. so, I'm so I'm thankful of that. So we don't, usually do final thoughts during these episodes but i have to get i have to say this because as a new jerseyan and a native plant enthusiast it's my duty to put this out there but yes uh as, when you're listening to this it'll be tomorrow is the new jersey native plant society actually they say it backwards it's the native plant society of new jersey's uh annual conference which is virtual this year and i think is free to attend i don't i don't know all the registration info but if you Google native plant side in New yeah. Jersey. I know it's free, okay. but I don't know. I don't know if you had to register already. I doubt you did. Just go on Google that. It'll take you to their website. Um, and then just find where the events tab is. It'll have their annual conference sign up. There's some really, really great speakers. Uh, one of which is Randy Eckel from Toad Shade Nursery, oh, who is probably one of the smartest native plant people I know. And someone that we want to have on here to represent, yeah. uh, the native yeah. plant side in New Jersey at some point. And, um, and then another person who I've been seeing on Facebook pop up a lot is uh, Elaine Silverstein. She may even be Dr. Elaine Silverstein. Okay. And uh, I don't remember where it talks about, but it's one of the ones I remember when I was looking at the agenda, I'm like, I need to listen to that because she puts in some really thoughtful comments in these native plant groups online. Gotcha. So if you are from New Jersey and you didn't know about this, make sure you sign up for that uh, tonight so you can go on to tomorrow hopefully you're not listening on sunday <laughs> you're too late <laughs> they do a good job of recording a lot of this and oh, putting awesome. it later later awesome. too um and even if you're not from new jersey but you're from pa or local or you want to find out what's happening in new jersey this is a really good place and a really good organization to be a part of in our state uh to get involved with native yeah. plants you know that's one thing you know you you could there's there's a, a ton of negatives that go along with covid but you know, doing these things via online have, has really opened everything up to such a larger yeah. audience that yeah. you really, you can, you have the time where you can, There's, you know, even if they record it, you're in time, you're getting to see a lot of these yeah. conferences that maybe, you know, oh, it's a busy time of the year. We can't go, or that one's too far away. We yeah. can't go. There's no excuse not to learn anymore. Yeah. Uh, and I hope this is one of the things that, that stays as we, I do too. we come out of, out of COVID as more people get vaccinated and, and, this starts to fade into our memories. 
I think hope one of the things that stays is this ability to access all this great information and great lessons um, whenever you want. Yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons we want to do this podcast. I was talking to my dad about um, how, uh, I, how we were looking at some of our guests and how much we're learning. He's like, well, you're basically giving yourself a college education from like the best and brightest <laughs> with, yeah. with all these people you're talking to. It's uh, you really learn like we're learning a lot in addition to to putting it out there for everyone to learn. So. Yeah. No, I've, I've learned so much in this past year. Cause we, it has been a year for us. Yeah. You know, yeah. it was the February 25th was the official mm-hmm. one year. And we kind of mentioned it in the last buzz, but you know, it's, it has been such an education. I feel like I've learned more in this past year just from this podcast than I've probably learned in the last five or six years yeah. just from conferences. Definitely. You know, so it's yeah, I'd like to keep that going. Definitely. It's it's Definitely. more challenge, and we find ourselves, I think, challenging ourselves with who we want to have on at this point. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, we still have that long list of people that that we talked about from the beginning where we mm-hmm. still haven't crossed everyone off that list. When yet. we're slowly chipping away at it, yeah. there's just so many other people that come up that that um that listeners want to hear from or or some a conversation happens and sparks oh we should really have them on to talk about this topic yeah uh that we there's some things we want to address uh that are are very uh spur of the moment i guess is one way it's something where yeah. it comes up and say hey we want to get on this right we, now yeah we need to talk so, about that so. so awesome with that we were wrapped up uh, thank you again for listening to native plants healthy planet especially this buzz edition of native plants healthy planet sponsored by pinelands nursery uh frame on to you i haven't done this in in a week yeah i I had to do it all last week i was out of breath like i i I was like wow i'm showing my age like i'm like i had to take a break uh as always uh we're going to give a huge thank you to rj comer for our buzz theme music which i love our and we we premiered rj's uh theme music to rooted discussions on the last episode so thank you so much rj for contributing those make sure you stream or buy rj's music on itunes spotify or or wherever you consume your music you can follow us on Twitter at Pineland Nursery, Facebook at Pinelands Nursery NJ, Instagram at Pinelands Nursery, and we have our uh, custom URL, Pinelands Nursery, at, at YouTube. Um, we have the question and answer line or question and comment line. You can call us at 215-346-6189. Again, 215-346-6189. Ask a question or leave a comment. If we pick your question or comment, we will uh, play it and answer it on a future episode of The Buzz. And uh, we we finally surpassed the 300 mark in the uh, Native Plant Healthy Planet Facebook group. And I love when we get new members and they're active right away and it kind of mm-hmm. like spurs everyone else on. Everyone has been so um, receptive to new yeah. members. Like, yeah. you know, like anything else, like for me as a music lover, when you love a band and, and they're they're unknown and they start becoming popular, you're like, eh, it's not the same, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's. Oh, that's like a. I think that's one of the things that happens in the native plant community too. Yeah. Is people get very protective of it, but yeah. it hasn't been the case in, in our group. No, everyone's been very welcoming. So uh, if you haven't joined that Facebook group, please join. And we're going to keep the conversation going there. Yeah. Uh, you can listen to native plants, healthy plant directly at www.nativeplantshealthyplant.com. You can also check us out on Apple podcast, Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, really wherever you consume your podcast. When you're there, please subscribe and leave a review. We just got another couple five star views yeah, just in the yeah last, we did last, thank uh, you so much for those episode. we, we really appreciate, appreciate it. it um and the biggest thing you can do is share this with a friend and ask them to subscribe as well the more ears we can reach the more people are learning about native plants and that's what we really have to do is is convince more people that they need to be using native plants yeah and 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 we appreciate you know, you sharing the message or, or asking us to share the message tom and i have actually been asked for a few like small little speaking engagements mm-hmm. and things like that we're we're always happy to share so you know but if you can make these circles larger please that's that's the most important thing we need to sh- uh, spread and share this message yeah so the last thing you can do to play this podcast is what i say every time you can ask Alexa to play the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast. That's what I do at home. I'm washing nice. the dishes. I say, Alexa, play the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast. It comes right on, and I don't even have to use my hands to do I, it. I say it right to my fire stick, yeah. like so watch it on the TV. Like, you, you know, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. With that, thanks, everyone. I'm Tom. And I am Fran. Thank you again, everyone. We'll see you next time for our – can we say who the next guest is or no? Is it confirmed? It's not confirmed yet. All right. I'm not going to say. We'll see you for the next Meet Our Guest episode of the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast. Until then, keep it native.
Thank you for listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.